Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. I'm here today with my good friend and very bright mind, uh, John Connor. So a lot of you know about John Connor from just online. You've seen him post, um, you know, his his comments with like axioms and premises and of course the ellipses that he's so famous for. Well, today you get to meet the man. And also we're going to be talking about classical theism and also um, let's see here. Let me get the whole term right. It's neo minongian transcendental existential Thomist theism, or entet. So it's going to be a lot of fun. But first, John, uh, I think, you know, a lot of us on the community, we're interested in knowing more about you. So just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, I go by John Connor online. I'm sort of... Uh... I'm, I'm retired and I, my hobby is uh, sort of philosophy. When I was growing up, my uh, family wasn't really into philosophy, so I didn't have the benefit of actually going to university and studying philosophy. But now that I'm retired, I sort of picked it up as a, as a hobby. So I've got lots of time on my hands to construct these arguments and think about ontologies. And I had a uh, sort of a, a vocation that I wanted to go and become a Carthusian. So I looked into that. And uh, the Carthusians that I talked to sort of put me on the right path to understanding ontology, metaphysics, Thomism, learning logic. I found that maybe that wasn't my vocation because I was sort of a revert later in life. So mm -hmm. I figured I can sort of be a mystic in uh, amongst the hoi polloi or whatever, you know what I mean? So anyways, I'm not tagging myself as a mystic or anything, but I just think about these things that maybe we can improve the way we understand Thomism with the way that physics is, you know, with holography and uh, black hole information, paradox, quantum mechanics, where there's not really a particle. It's a particle or a wave or it's a probability smear. We don't know exactly what underpins reality. So my argument is basically that mind underpins reality. So what, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I was going to ask you, actually, before we get into that subject, when uh, before you retired, what was your job? Were you like a, I'm guessing a physicist? Uh, that's just my guess. But what were you before you retired? Uh, well, my family had pharmacies. So we worked in, the, I, I worked in the pharmacy. So I basis is a math. I did pharmacy math. I did chemistry. So I have more like an analytical type of mind. Yeah. So that, that type of philosophy appealed to me. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's what I basically did. Yeah. So did you want me to get into a few of the notes here that I got on uh, the neo Mignangian Thomism? Sure. So I remember we said you would cover six motivations for classical theism. Right. And then six motivations for neo Mignangian existential Thomas, Thomism or whatever, you know. Right. So. Yeah, it's just basic. I'm not going to really hash out or hammer out the whole thing because that would probably be the, you know, the contents of a book. But I'm just sort of going to cursorily go over the, the point. So basically, sure. uh, the, the, to the Thomism that I'm dealing with is sort of like a quantum watchmaker kind of ontology where there's a mind that is provides the semantic determination for the way the world is because from a lot of you know from raw i don't know if you're familiar with ross's argument that and kripke that uh in in principle a physical system is is semantically indeterminate of, 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 among incompossible forms right so we basically need a mind that provides a semantic determination for us to be what we are. You know, we, we operate that way. We have synteresis, we have natural law, we work for ends, and that's the whole idea be behind the Aristotelian final causality. That, that's what makes us who we are. So basically our soul is the form, and that form is, is the semantic determination which provides the topology for how our body emerges in space time. So this type of Thomism is sort of like minds in a vat and the mind is sort of entangled information and it provides the whole in Marism for the soul being in every part of the body at once. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of, um, what was it? Alex Press's chapter in um, Neo Aristotelian perspectives on contemporary science. So I think he said something like, um, so his theory was the theory of like traveling forms, right? Where the, 
the yeah, form. that's what I, exactly what I have in mind. Yeah. Right. You see, we have a modal structure, so there really is no mechanistic. There's no mechanistic causality. It's more act potency privation, sustaining of potencies, accreting potencies. So basically, a being is a modal packet that sort of is actualizing potencies and you sort of plugged into an organic simulation. So we're not really in one world. We're in our world, but all the worlds are braided together as sort of like time worms, tense, uh, like a tenseless temporal parted worm, if that makes sense. So subjectively, because we're discursive theory, but because of the deep thinking of a many world quantum um, event, the decoherence is, is time. And then that all those things exist in a certain sort of getting at. So basically, I wrote down. So this is a hylomorphic reduction. Everything reduces to pure S itself or tantum S. E S S E. I pronounce it S, could be wrong. But that's God himself. Hey, John, can I stop you real quick? We don't protect God. We participate. Yeah, so John, like um, your, your internet connection's a little messed up. So what you might have to do is you might have to uh, stop the video and just use audio. Really? Yeah. The internet connection's no good. Well, oh, it, you can't see my face? The audio and the video was like a little jumpy, you know? So like we would hear you say something and then it would like, you know, glitch out. And then um, we, we oh. would, yeah, we would appear in like the middle of your, we'd hear the middle of your sentence, but not the beginning part of it. Oh, I see. Did you want me to change my room? Maybe it would be better or is it, is it better now? Uh, right now it's good, but I don't, I don't know, like, um, We'll just have to see what happens. <laughs> okay. Well, you want to just keep going as, a, as or is this really a, a bad tech issue? Um, I mean, it's making it, it, it's going to be really difficult to. I, understand what I'm saying. Yeah, it's 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 like uh, it's really messing up. Uh, so if you click on stop video, then that might help, you know. So stopping video, just having audio, that oh, might work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so stop video. Yeah, that might help. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yep. Is that good? Okay. Well, at least you saw me at the beginning. If you want to cut my face out for the rest I guess we have to do it maybe because I'm so far away because I'm sort of out in the sticks here in Borneo right so the towers that we have it gets a little bit sketchy with the with the transmission yeah you know what I mean mm -hmm. and now with the COVID maybe there's quite a few people at home so there there's a lot of people sharing on a tower at, at, the, at the moment does yeah. that make sense yeah 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 we'll make it through. well anyways We'll make it through. So basically, the hylomorphic reductive idealism is a reduction to a pure mind, which is God. So we have a substantial form, which preserves our essential character or our diachronic identity. So you're familiar with that, right? Not the diachronic identity part, no. No, identity through time. Oh, because yeah. If we don't have, if we don't have a, if we don't have a substantial form, then. Our accidents, which is our, you know, our accidental properties, sort of uh, are grounded in nothing, really. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You have the, the ontic structuralism or the bundle theory, where you have compressence of properties. So you got like a third man argument going on there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you. Okay. So basically, we've got the substantial form, we've got the accidental form, which is the non-essential character of a being, which is the properties, you know, like whiteness, 
or, uh, or shape, the shape of a geometric reading exists as an essence because you can reduce it to information. You know what I mean? So all these properties would exist. So that's how you can have your round square. You can have squareness and roundness as existing properties, but they can't cohere because the, the, nucle the nucleation of the object is contradictory. But it still exists as a certain object, like as Mein Yang says, like a, a homeless object. Mm -hmm. So we also have proper accidents, which is what we are, or what we have. We have a body, right? So we have to have a proper accident to, be a, to have our sim experience to have our phenomenal rendering going on because that's what matter is under this under this ontology matter is like just phenomenal rendering or it's it's s as experienced based on your essence modes of s so it's phenomenal s abstract s rational s in a composite so you think about an essence as being a prism and the modes of S are like light, and you know how the prism breaks up the light depending on its facets or whatever. So it depends upon what your quantum, what your essence or your quiddity is, is defined as, or the semantic content of the information. And that's the type of modes of S that it will accrete. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can hear me, right? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, good. Sorry. And, uh, and then prime matter under this ontology would be something like the wave function, you know, the word universal wave function that we have that we understand from quantum mechanics. So it's like a pure potency that can, that can, that can accrete forms. So it can change into anything. God is the sort of ultimate active potency that can plug equations into this that can collapse into what we understand and see and experience as the real world sort of makes sense right mm -hmm. well Heil would be information and morph would be the form so it would be something like the form is the semantic content is the soul which determines the topology of the emergent 2d spatial temporal body because under holographic principle you have information on a 2d plane and it's like uh perturbations of uh, qubits and that's how we get our information coming up into three three d plane if i'm understanding it correctly so it's basically an emergent body and information and then the way we experience is we just render that information as sense information or what have you so here we have beings which would be ends e n s in a Thomas reading. So beings would be like a modal packet or a quanta made up of modes of S and an essence. So an essence determines the modal character. So that would be what essence as definition. So it would be your quiddity. You're familiar with that term, quiddity? Mm -hmm. What something is. And then we have the actus ascendi, which would be sort of like the hecate. Or am I um, pronouncing that right? But that's the that's a Dun Scotus term like the individuation so as i said before there's no mechanism causality we have like a, a reality as a modal structure so we have many worlds and we have counterparts of us but they're not in soul counterparts they sort of break off as we're experiencing time through decoherence so the packets would be and equals quanta as modal packets. So based on the holographic universe, all accidental forms are, are sort of like a Tegmarkian math object. So we have just structure, math structure. So matter is an abstract object. So under this ontology, God is pure concrete. Souls are less concrete because they're dependent or they're contingent beings. And then after that, you have just your abstract forms but they exist. So a natural number would be, the quiddity would be a countable information and it would exist as an abstract, but it would have, it would have a rational S, it would have abstract S, but it would have the potency to accrete other types of S. So we can think about abstract numbers. 
so they can exist in minds, but they do really exist out there, sort of like Plato's Eidos or something like that. And God is grounding all those, the natural numbers. But we can also make a sculpture of a natural number. So we have essence types and we have essence tokens, how they can appear in the real world. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. So, basically, yeah, basically, I'll go to the next page here. So the creative act here is God's self-apprehension. And the intellective act is, it's an intellective act. So hence, because God is completely in contingent. So he's not, a, he's not a real person. So theistic personalism wouldn't work here because God's not in composition with anything. He doesn't have a real relation, sort of. with uh because we would have an eternal event under mode so we've always existed as sort of a mode of god's creative act or an attribute of god but then we're experiencing we're plugged into that stim the organic simulation so it express this sort of ontology explains creation ex nihilo not that god's doing something and making something ex external to himself but what God is doing, he's turning in on himself, which is his modeless experience of himself. And out of that modeless experience of himself, God, we get the shadows of what of the divine ideas. And God is seeing all the goodness in himself. That's how we say that uh, bonum est diffusivum si, sweet. So God apprehends himself, and that act affects creation under modes of escommion. So when we understand the way that things exist under different modes, then Kant's dictum sort of is impotent against this ontology because existence is just different modes of existence. And we understand under modal actualism, this realism that God is the ground. And we have a lot of logical uh, motivations to, you know, we have epistemic and logical warrant to believe that this can be true, that God is this modally pure act. So God would be, in, in this ontology, God would be in a simplistic way. God would be metaphysically simple in that God is limitless. And his creative act is limitless information. And his eternal act of self-knowing is just the operational trinity. That's the effect of the eternal self-knowing. So did you, want me to, did you want to ask me about the motivations? Yeah, so... Um... Let's see, would this be the motivations for classical theism or the motivations for the, basically just the, for MTET? Okay, well, I guess first, did you have questions about what I talked about there at the beginning? Did it make sense? Was it cohesive? Because I'm sort of new to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I'm also really new to this as well. I mean, because like, um, you know, most of the Thomas that I've talked to, even like, you know, when I talked to Rob Coons about this, you know, I asked yeah, him, right? Yeah, he could tell you everything about Thomism. So, <laughs> well, like I asked him about idealism and he, he said basically like, you know, he didn't, he didn't buy into it. And, right. um, but a lot of people can say that, oh, what's up? It is a little novel. Yeah, it, it is a little novel. It'd be, it would be hard to really accept it. But I think from a mystical standpoint, a lot of the mystics would affirm that something like that would be a real option. Now back to you, what were you going to say? Yeah, well, I was just going to say that for Rob, he, he believed that like matter, that there had like matter is something real and it's not just an abstract object as it were under your ontology, right? And what you're mm -hmm. saying is that contemporary physics is changing our very conception of what matter is, correct? Right. Yeah. Right, right. I would say it's more of a sim and you get phenomenal rendering, but... You know they do have the um, they do have the structure of uh, molecules, atoms, quarks, leptons, bosons, fermions. You know what I mean? Quasi particles. Yeah. Now they have quasi particles. They have anions, which are sort of like two D particles. And then you know I think as they go further and further and further down the the rabbit hole, they're going to see that basically it's it's just a mind. I mean, sure you can't figure that you could only figure it out conceptually that it would have to be something like that 
because I don't think, you know, we can ground everything in strings because you can't have many ontologically necessary beings. You can only have one ontologically necessary being because the ontologically necessary being has to be uh, of necessity omnipotent, right? So you can't have two omnipotent beings. Uh, I'll just go over the argument for that later. But so, yeah, I'll do the motivations for classical theism first. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. I'm excited. Yeah. So, I mean, you'll know a lot of these already probably. The, like the, the first one I have, the motivation for classical theism would be to avoid muriological nihilism. So if we have many ontologically necessary primitives, which is what some people who would hold existential inertia would say, then we have no eminent ground. We have accidents grounded in nothing, right? So basically, we have no substances. We just have these physical particles that are themselves contingent. So we have, what we're saying here is we have contingent necessary beings, which is sort of like a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So either you have one ontologically necessary object or you don't. Otherwise, you know, it doesn't really make sense. That's the first motivation. The second one is act potency is a better explanation for causal relations. Since the potency for non-existence of the universe is something real, we would have to see that as a real potency or a possibility. It must be grounded in something real. Like from Quine has a uh, identity statement where if something has a certain property, it has the possibility to ex uh, instantiate that property. You know, if, if I have the property of being rational, I can instantiate the property of being a French speaker. But if I'm a broom, I don't have that potency to be a French speaker, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just common sense. So that's why I'm just saying, basically, what this uh, causal relations is just intentional rendering and um, it's um, actualizing these potencies that we have. So that's another motivation. Another one would be the mind-body binding problem because under hylomorphic dualism or idealism, I mean, maybe it wouldn't be so much of a problem at, under hylomorphic dualism, but it would be a problem under ontological dualism or reductive physicalism because What's, how are we reacting? How are we compressing our experience together from just neurons? It just seems to be like Kripke's arguments where he says pain fibers, or C fibers firing is not necessarily pain, mm -hmm. that identity um, argument. So if we, po if we posit a single composite substance or being that we have the matter or the phenomenal experience as the sense organs informs the hylomorphic soul. Since the soul is the semantic content for the emergent body, and since the intellect is determinant, this explains human nature as an ordered process towards specific ends. So it's just, it's just sort of the binding problem falls away because it's all a, uh, an event in the mind. And let me see here. We got another motivation. The fourth one would be modal actualism, like I mentioned before. God is the omnipotent ground. So this is analytically true. We cannot have many omnipotent beings whose exist essence is existence. So, like I said, it goes back to muriological nihilism. It, it doesn't make sense. You have the Louisian possibilism, but that doesn't make sense either because what is everything grounded in? It has to be grounded in something real because no potency can sort of exist in nothing at all. So you're on the same page here? Yeah. Yeah. And then another motivation for, um, this would be a motivation probably for both Manyagian theism and uh, the uh, Hylum, and the um, Thomism, classical theism, would be the holographic universe. Because if the universe is basically information, on a 2D plane, which requires semantic content to emerge, then you would need a mind that would be, that would be holding that semantic content, that would be grounding it. 
And the, the sixth one is the identity preservation in a diachronic manner. If there's no substantial forms, like we have under classical theism, we only have compressions of properties or accidents with no substance. Hence, potencies exist in nothing. So we have a third man problem under bundle theory. So we have in, infinite ontological regrets. So do you have any questions about those? Uh, so one of the first things that I thought about was, you know, so a lot of this is going to depend upon your interpretation of quantum mechanics or quantum theory. And I know that a lot of uh, naturalists, right, or materialists, they want to avoid uh, saying that consciousness or mind is fundamental. Um, what are your thoughts on right. the, their attempts to avoid saying or coming to your commitments? What, what do you think is, is the, the problem with them saying that there is that mind emerges from matter? Yeah, something like that, right? Because is they don't believe mind is fundamental. They think matter is fundamental. Yeah, well, like I said, the, the Ross argument sort of spells that out, right? Because we are, we are semantically determinate beings. We mm -hmm. have synteresis. We can recognize certain things are good, certain things are bad for us. We are ordered towards a teleonomy, an end. So we are teleologic beings. And from Ross's argument, if you, if you look it up, I, I'm not gonna explain the whole argument, but from Ross's argument that uh, only a mind can preserve truth, right? Only a mind can really be doing modus ponens because among incompossible forms, what do we have? We can have plus, we can have plus, we can have the, uh, what was Quine saying? You can have rabbit parts or like, what do you mean by, by that specific thing or, or by that understanding or by that proposition? Whereas under mind being the determinant source, we have a cohesive picture that mind is determining the matter, is determining the final cause, because in nature, you don't have really a efficient cause for the universe or a final cause. It doesn't seem to be determinate, but the way we act is completely the opposite. So does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, uh, the, so, Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, like, um, another question that popped up in my head, too. So I remember uh, Shane Wagner in uh, the Reason and Religion uh, uh, online community. He said something like, um, under classical theism, God is the modal structure of reality. I wanted to get your thoughts on whether or not you yeah. think that's an accurate claim. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would. I wouldn't say God himself in his nature is the is because god himself in his nature is modeless right mm -hmm. there's no it's just infinite existence so there's not any like real univo univocity or whatever they say in being god is a different type of being that we can't really understand but i would say the shadow of what god is the creative act the existence of creative beings god would be that modal structure so god's creative act is the modal structure so it's it's a it's a it's a myriad of forms sort of like plato's allegory of the cave right it always has been that there's a there's a meme going around on the internet <laughs> yeah called yeah plato's cave allegory where it always has been forms on the wall mm. so basically i think uh we're we're going back to aristotle and plato and Thomas, every philosophy sort of went away. And now I think they're getting forced back to realizing that it is something like that, hmm. what they were saying. I'm also interested in how you would yeah. approach like the- So uh, did you want me to go over the motivations? Well, I was just gonna say, uh, I was interested in seeing your uh, approach to kind of the standard objections to classical theism like for instance, um, modal collapse, um, you know, the objection yeah. that God must change. Yeah, this one's God's not changing, right? God mm. is just understanding himself and the effect of that self understanding, God is always understanding himself and it's an, inter it's an eternal changeless act. So 
there is no time in God. It's just a uh, it's just a logical space in God. So it's just like a it's like a a, comp, a complicated limitless information. I would say in a Scottish sense. So there is a little bit of university of being there, but under my under my uh, ontology, yes, God is is necessarily a creator, but it's how the modes um, appear or how they come into being is a little, little bit of a different story because we've always, all the modes have always existed in God's mind. It's just a matter of how it's being experienced by us. So sure, we can say the universe did have a beginning, but before that it was always in a state of potency, right? And it's mm. like a infinite, uh, an infinite point of uh, of modal action of, of modal potency. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying I'm saying certain types of modal collapse are, are not correct. Saying that God God has to be exist. You know, every world is the same. They have that modal collapse, and that doesn't make sense because sure God is necessarily the creator, but it doesn't follow that every world is the same. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm reminded of um, was it Christopher's paper on this very yeah. issue? Christopher Tomaszewski, Jack. Yeah, he's doing Quine's Planets, and that one's a pretty effective. I think he pretty much killed modal collapse on that paper. Like that's a brilliant paper. Mm -hmm. Mine is is more we do have a little bit of collapse there you can understand maybe that god is necessarily the creator and he can't get out of that because my motivation is goodness and being and truth are all convertible transcendentals so because god is good he's the final cause of things because god is being god is also goodness because goodness is just being under a different aspect in the intellect Mm -hmm. So, because goodness is always necessarily diffusive of itself, God is always creating. He never stops creating, but it's in a timeless sense. So, it's kind of, I guess, a little bit of a contradictory thing to under, how we can understand God is always creating, but in a timeless way. Mm. So, but you're saying it follows for like from the premises, right? Even though the conclusion might seem kind of foreign to us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Also, well, you know, I remember Christopher Tomaszewski in, in the discussion with Joe Schmid. He said, "If uh, he said if Platonism is true, then Thomism is false." And I take it that your position is more of a Neoplatonic one, right? So it's not. Yeah, it's not, it is. It yeah. is. Yeah. So can you just yeah. talk about the difference between your position and Platonism? Well, I would say that it's it's. It's, uh, it's quite similar because it's sort of like the ideas of God as shadows. I don't see how Platonism, how the two could really clash. Mm. It seems it would work quite well if you use the, the idealism approach where everything is reducing to an act of God's understanding. I don't see, can you hash that out? How it would be a, how it would be a um, clash there? I mean, like the the general way that people frame it is um, in terms of divine aseity, right? So God has to be above all the abstracta, um, and if there's anything that's, and then everything has to be dependent on God, and God is not dependent on anything else. So then, if Platonism, well, the way I sort of go past that objection is mm -hmm. uh, s, s subsistence. Mm -hmm. You have s subsistence, s commune, actus ascendi modes of creative modes you know i think existential thomas hold to that where god is just s divinis or tantum s and then there's modes of the creative act so maybe it's sort of like the orthodox powers energies essence does that make sense like necessary powers that god has god is still above okay. everything in his own in his own knowing yeah, I mean, and you're like you you're you're basically advocating like divine conceptualism. You're not denying that the 
the abstract I have being or, or exist, right? Right, right, um, because yeah, yeah. The abstract would have to exist, like math mm -hmm. objects do exist. It's not a construction of the mind. Maybe some objects like that do exist as constructions of human mind, but that would be humans um, sort of discovering or participating in the act of creation. But all the potencies would pre-exist in God. There's no way that we can say that there is something outside God that pre-existed God. So everything has to be a mode of God's existence. Essences. So I, what I have is a complementary type of causality. The essence causes the S to contract. Mm. God creates the essences. God creates the S. God creates everything. I guess it would be characters in a sim that can still be autonomous. And the, the minds or the souls are existing outside the sim, but they're experiencing the sim as they go. So in that way, they are composite creatures because they can exist, exist through a body, whereas angels would be pure intellects and they would be experiencing things without a body. So an angel could be somewhere... By just thinking, let's say, you know, if I want to be in France and I'm an angel, I can just think to be in France and I'll be there, right? But mm. Whereas we have to be in our body and we have to simulate that experience of being in the airplane and whatnot, right? Buying the ticket. Because we're discursive reasoners, right? We have to go by composing and dividing and understanding what's the repercussions of our actions. Whereas angels can foresee the repercussions of their actions, which sort of explains the fall a little bit you know that's why the devil is sort of determined and obstinate because he sort of he knew the repercussions of his acting before he did it and why humans still get chances to improve through grace makes sense yeah that's a it's a lot to take in and uh you know it reminds me of some of the stuff that's on kyle allender's channel christian idealism or something like that um, yeah, I, I mean, it sounds pretty far out, some of that, sure. But my, my idealism is a reductive idealism, that it's God's act. Like, we're not doing anything where it's like a Berkeley's idealism, mm. but it's just God's act of mind underpins everything, because God can't be in composition. Yeah. So maybe if down the line we see that there is another type of substance other than matter that can sort of contract forms that it's like it's like something that god's created but it's not matter i'll accept that and i'll update this theory right but as it is right now i'm just working by what from what we know that it, it would be more like a sim that like in in the matrix movie right where you see the different possibilities occurring at the same time and we're plugged in and we're just phenomenally rendering everything that god is already pre-authored every possible world and then we're plugged in that's our act of creation and then we live out our life do you know what i mean mm. but we still have autonomy in there it's sort of a compatibilist autonomy you know we can't break out of the sim we don't have absolute libertarian freedom but we're yeah. free to to act within a, among certain actions we can do this or counterfactually we can do that or we could have done that or we could have done this and god knows all those already it's preordained because from the quantum many worlds all those worlds exist mm -hmm. in god already because it's a mind it's it's fabricated from his mind as a shadow of what god really is so in that sense it's platonism do you mm. know what i mean because we're not directly in god's mind god is not the formal cause he's just the efficient cause so it's not spinoza spinozoism you know uh baruch spinoza where he had the pantheism mm. it's not that it's not that god's the formal cause of things god's the efficient cause of things through his mind so it's an act an intentional act of his self-knowing which is sort of reflected off the divine light and seen as a shadow on what reality is. And then we're composite souls. So I, I guess S commune contingent composite, 
or concrete, concrete contingent. So our souls have more being than abstract objects. They don't exist in the same way. So did you want me to go over motivation, uh, motivations for the Mainyangian timism? Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm having a great, I'm having a great time. Boring at this point because I, maybe I'm going over things double, but anyways, the motivations for the Mainyangian timism would be basically the holographic universe. If the universe is information and the mind is a semantic content, then we have the hylomorphic idealism. So matter is just modes of existence from existential Thomism. It's phenomenal rendering. Of, there's no real matter. It's not a solid something out there. But it is an experience that's not inside our mind, really. So there is a little bit of a dualism in there. And then this, the second one would be holographic universe under ADS CFT correspondence. Space time is emerging from the 2D plane. It helps us answer some like the info paradox, I the, the black hole info paradox is like they're saying that it's a, a hologram on top of a hologram. So because the info paradox is saying whatever falls into a black hole can't be lost because under quantum mechanics, the wave function has to preserve the information. So everything will collapse into one state. So they figured it out using the holographic universe as a model. That information can escape and it can be held on the plane, on the 2D plane. So I guess from Quine's indispensability argument, we should accept something like a holographic universe because it does answer fundamental questions about reality. It's not just where people say, we can't be realists about science, science. that well, sure there's hypercubes and all that, but hypercubes and whatnot don't exist in reality, right? But I would say that we should take this holographic universe seriously because they might be able to figure out things about quantum gravity as well. So the next one, one, two, three, um, symmetric. So we've got that modal actualism. I went through the Ross Kripke, Kripke Quine argument, the semantic indeterminacy of physical systems among incompossible forms. So only minds can preserve semantically determinate truth. Hence, from synteresis and final causality, the soul is a semantically determined body. I was going to mention also the Gale Press argument mm -hmm. from uh, the from the weak and the strong PSR. I don't know if you are familiar with that Gale Press argument. It's a pretty powerful argument. You should no. Check tell it me out. about it. I want to want to learn more about it. Tell me about it. Yeah, it's really, it's really quite an interesting argument. It's got the weak PSR that the, in, a, in, a, in a possible world, there is a possible world that has the same PSR as the real world. So God must be a personal explanation. From the PSR, we can have two types of explanations. Alexander Press boils it down. We can have a scientific explanation of facts, or we can have a personal explanation. Mm -hmm. So what he reasons, and he reasons correctly because also he's a brilliant mind, right? But he reasons correctly that the scientific fact is based on a certain, uh, on contingent facts. So itself, it's part of the big contingent fact. So if you take the mm -hmm. big contingent fact of all contingent facts, and you make it into, a factor it, and you plug it into the PSR, which is for all X and all Y, there exists this the y such that uh, r y x y is a reason for x and x is a contingent fact you do it in predicate logic then we see that it has to be a personal explanation and it can't be a contingent it has to be an ontologically it has to be logically necessary of itself it has to be ontologically necessary of itself it has to be a like uh, pressing and kuhn say in their recent paper there has to be one fact to ward off the you know, skepticism that mm -hmm. explains all the facts. Otherwise, we can't be sure about our reasoning, right? So this is a pretty brilliant argument that there has to be a mind that's grounding reality. So that's how I get this hylomorphic reductive idealism. This mind, the act of this mind is causing reality to be the way it is. So it's a pretty good argument. It's a very long argument, but you should read it. 
The next one is uh, Josh Rasmussen had an argument that I read about uh, thought grounding and thoughts cannot be determined from matter based on the grounding axes. And it's a pretty complicated argument again. But you have to check it out. I think it's in Wiley or something. That's another one that, that ties into Ross that uh, only a mind can be semantically determinate. And I have two more here. I have uh, from Thomas Aquinas's Summa, part one, question 14, article four, respond of God's knowledge. So I'm just going to read a little bit of Thomas Aquinas. He says, I answer that it must be said that the act of God's intellect is his substance. For if, if his act of understanding were other than his substance, then something else, as the philosopher says, would be the act and perfection of the divine substance, to which the divine substance would be related as potentiality is to act, which is altogether impossible, because the act of understanding is the perfection and act of the one understanding. So to understand is not an act passing to anything extrinsic, for it remains in the operator as his own act and perfection, as existence is the perfection of the one existing. Just as existence follows form, so in like manner, to be understood follows the intelligible species, or to understand, I'm sorry, follows the intelligible species. Now in God, there is no form, which is something other than his existence from Thomism, God's essence is his existence. Hence, as his essence itself is also his intelligible species, it necessarily follows that his act of understanding must be his essence and his existence. So this, I think, sets us up for that reductive hylomorphic idealism. Mm -hmm. God is tantum s, pure concrete being. Yet our being is not God's being, since God is not the direct form formal cause, but God is the efficient sustaining cause. So we don't have pantheism under this reductive hylomorphic idealism, but we have an act of understanding, which is the highest mode or the highest modal packet. It's no passive potencies, all active potencies. So God is omnipotent in that way in that he grounds all the potencies. God's not omnipotent in the, in the crazy atheist understanding he can't sit beside me in, in, in music he probably could through the hypostatic union but you know they didn't have pianos back in Jerusalem so I mean he's not omnipotent in that sense so I think there's a there's a profound misunderstanding about what we mean by omnipotent but when you understand modal actualism then you understand exactly what we mean by this more theistic modal realism or the modal actualism that god grounds all potencies he's all potent and there can only be one so the next one is from another quote from aquinas which sets us up for this is a uh, summa contra gentiles book three on providence chapter 18 article 5 how god is the end of all things moreover the effect must tend toward the end in the same way that the agent works for the end now, God, who is the first agent of all things, I think the atheist would even accept this. Now, God, who is the first agent, that something is attained by his action, but by for he is not in potency to the possibility of obtaining something, rather he is in act simply. And as a result, he is a source of enrichment. So things are not ordered to God as to an end for which something may be obtained, but rather so that they may be in, they may attain himself from himself according to their measure, since he is their end. So this is a pretty powerful thing that Aquinas is saying here. It's sort of like his fourth way. If mm -hmm. you're familiar with Aquinas' fourth way, mm -hmm. that there has to be some highest good that everything is ordered toward this final causality, this, this synteresis in us. So it's another motivation for how a mind determines the end. 
because mindless matter is not determining the end of anything. It doesn't make sense. It's indeterminate among incompossible forms, as, as Kripke, Ross, Quine said. So it has to be a mind that's determining matter to be a certain way from the holographic universe, and we just follow it on down the lines. So we need a sustaining cause, we need an efficient cause, we need a final cause, because the final cause answers the question, why? So that's why I call this ontology a quantum watchmaker kind of ontology. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've, this encapsulates the idea of the neo myangian existential Thomism because things find their being by accreting modes of S. Hence, Ross says, only a mind can be semantically determinate among incompossible forms. So the mind determines the phenomenal rendering is the info under modes, which is basically our experience of matter, whatever matter is. But basically, matter is information plus mind stuff. So that's that one. Did you have any questions on those motivations? I mean, it's just, it's a lot to take in, to be honest. Like this is, um, this is a lot of, this is kind of new for me um, in a lot a of ways. Did I make it a little bit too wordy? <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I mean, wanted this... To make it, I wanted to make it enriching for people. I know it's a little bit novel and they might think it's weird and out there, but there is, there is motivation for it. There is an epistemic warrant is what the philosophers say, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. For our ontological commitments, right? So I'm going to stick by my guns and say that it is a mind and there's nothing that God is working in composition to create like a sculpture in that way. But that's totally a metaphor. You know what I mean? When they say God's the great magnet or God is a sculptor or he carried you in, our, in my troubled times or God is standing beside me. You know, there's a famous line in the cloud of unknowing. If you have ever read that treatise, it's written by a Carthusian, anonymous Carthusian, hmm. that when they say, when the spiritual novices understand these words up, in, out, beside, that when they say look up or lift up your heart, it's not looking up. Sure, you can think about looking up, but God is everywhere sustaining us. So it's not in, God is not inside us, but God is in our understanding of everything. In that way, he semantically determines us by giving us the form of our body by creating it so we can be we can be uh we can apprehend intelligible forms Does that makes sense mm -hmm. yeah yeah that, that's another book that people should read if they're interested in mysticism uh the cloud of unknowing so uh, any questions on that um, one of the questions that I had was that it seems as if, you know, I'm thinking about Rasmussen and Felipe Leon's book, um, Is God the Explanation of Everything, or something like that. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they talked about, I think uh, when my interview with Rasmussen, he talked about how him and um, Leon, they eventually, at the end of the book, almost came to a kind of agreement, where they both agreed that, like, something at the foundation, like, I, I, I I'm not going to try to quote Rasmussen, but the idea was that they almost agreed on what the fundamental nature of reality is. The only thing that separated them was whether or not it was a mind or not. And right. And what you were what you were basically arguing is is that it has to be a mind, right? And it's it's not going to be necessarily a uh, univocally an intellect like ours, but it's certainly going to have no. strong similarities or similarities of some sort. It, right. Yeah. Right. That's how they say we were made in the image and likeness of God. So, you know, we do have a will. We do have an intellect. We can choose among how our world is going to be created by us. God gives us that option through the many worlds that are already created that he, we can work through that world and sort of make it our own. That's where, sort of where universalism fails, right? Because God's ontologically complete. Yeah. It has no real relation. So that's not going to impugn his goodness if 
if some of the sims fail, right? God is sustaining them out of his goodness, but if it's an act of the mind, there's not really, you know, flesh burning and all that. It's just a tormented consciousness. Do you hmm. understand what I'm saying? Yeah. God's not there, you know, there's not people there with, with uh, making fires and burning, burning flesh. Although it's semantically rendered that way because like they say, the, uh, the lightsome body or the glorified body has four attributes and likewise the, there's four attrib attributes for the bodies and for, for the souls in perdition, right? Hmm. Because we have the guardian angel that helps us through, or we can believe and follow the, the bad angel that will be tormenting us in hell forever, right? Mm. Although it might not be a, a nice thing to think about for the people who are Harchin, who believe in, uh, what's the guy's name, DBH? Yeah, the David Bentley Hart. Mm -hmm. But I think, yeah, I think there's a case for that because if, if God is saving everybody, I mean, this it's probably not part of the thing, but I'll make a comment on it. Sure. That if God is saving everybody, then he's acting of necessity. So, you know, Aquinas has a good uh, argument for that in the Summa Contra Gentiles, that God is not acting like a natural stone rolling down the hill. He doesn't act out of necessity, but he acts out of his will. Mm -hmm. So he creates worlds the way that he deems that they should be created according to his profound plan as the quantum watchmaker, right? So if, if God necessarily saves everybody, he's acting out of necessity. So you have sort of like a modal collapse there yeah. on God's mm, yeah. thing. So universalism, it might be a good emotive argument, but it's an entirely logically defunct argument. It's not working at all. So I don't know how people are following that line of reasoning. It's not, it's not, uh, I, I, I think the Thomas are too clever to fall for that type of reasoning yeah. yeah i mean it kind of reminds me of all the arguments that i've raised against universalism um i i'm right. I, yeah you're you're doing a good job on the internet really <laughs> good i wish there were more people like you that's really you're doing a great job getting these 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 brilliant minds on here to talk about god i mean you know you're getting rob coons who's like the top philosopher in the world i would say hmm. when i started studying this i was admiring his coon's cosmological argument with all the logic in it and i i was you know dumbfounded by how can the mind <laughs> capture all that logic and then i found that it, you know i i just love it and i started studying it and i like to do logical arguments too maybe sometimes they don't succeed but i think you're doing a great job bringing these minds together to discuss these things it's really good Thank you. Anyhow, did you want me to, maybe I'm getting long winded or do we have a time for, limit here or um, do you I mean, to um, I, I, I put together. Hmm? Is there anything that you want to talk about before we wrap up? Well, I, I put together three arguments here. Maybe I'll just put into, we have our logical warrant to accept that there's only one, uh, one omnipotent, we can only have one omnipotent grounding mind. Did you want me to run through that argument? Yeah, run through the arguments. Like, I have time. You know, I don't want to cut off a philosopher oh, or, yeah. you know, someone. Yeah. Yeah, because I was just arguing with some Thomas on the Thomas board, and uh, they were saying that um, you can't um, define God, right? But, but, I mean, according to modern logic, you can use Russell's theory of descriptions and you can do an apophatic definition, which is what, um, you know, there's this brilliant philosopher online that many people know named da Daniel Vecchio. He's a logician and uh, he would agree that you can provide a formalization of God. So I'll run through one of his arguments. And I think people should check into his uh, vexing questions blog because it's got brilliant arguments. If you're interested in logic, it's just um, we have the logical motivation for one omnipotent mind from uh, Robert Madoff. I don't know if you heard of Robert Madoff, mm -hmm. but he's a brilliant logician too. And he's formalized uh, sort of like a definite description of, of, of what it means to be supreme, but we have to understand it in a Thomist sense or sort of like uh, imp, imp, 
ontologically imperfectible, meaning if we understand it in a Meinagian sense, it's a packet, a modal packet that just contains all active potencies. And analytically, you can't have two of those things because there would be one active potency that the other would have to separate the two from, uh, if you study um, relational logic, you, you, you just have, you need one property that differentiates in the set from the other omnipotent being. So one would always be more omnipotent than the other would be always omnipotent than the other. So there can only be one with all the all active limitless potencies. It'd be like Cantor's absolute infinite. So basically what made all has for ontologically imperfectible X, I X equals, it's not possible that there exists a Y such as Y is greater than X if X is ontologically imperfectible. And it's not possible that there exists a Y such that not X equals Y, and, it, and it's not the case that X is not greater than Y. So what he's doing here with his argument, he's, he's using the diamond operator as possible, and he's using not necessarily not as, as a modal equivalent. So that's the only primitive is, is, the, um, is the necessary operator. He's not using the diamond operator at all. So what he's doing is he's assuming on conditional proof that we have one, that there's two Supremes. So he says SX and SZ. So there's two Supremes, conditional proof. So we plug those two into that formalization at the top. So we have the definition of two, two Supremes. I won't go through it. You just have to plug it in. Then you go to line three. So he has not, not necessarily not exists a Y such as G, Y, Z. So you get simplification on line two. Then for all Y, not G, Y, Z, through double negation, and then it's necessary exclusion, and then you get quantifier negation. Then line five, you get not G, X, Z. So it's not the case that X is greater than Z. So you get that through your standard um, logical rules. That would be for universal instantiation. Then you go to line six and you simplify line two again. So then line seven gives you for all y, it's not the case, open brackets, that not x equals y and not the case that g x y through six double negation, necessary elimination and quantifier negation. So then line eight, you get not bracket, not X equals Z and not G X Z, seven universal instantiation. Then line nine, you get G X Z or X equals Z through De Morgan's rule, double negation and commutation. But then you have to look back at line five where you already, you've already demonstrated that not G X Z. So you, had, you dispense the first part of the disjunction there. You say it's not G, X, Z. So it has to be X equals Z. So from five and nine dis disjunctive syllogism, you have X equals Z. So on a conditional proof, if you have two Supremes, then X equals Z. They're all, they're both have to be the same. And I think Zalta does that on one of his, uh, he, he goes through the logic of the ontological argument. He has a big long, complicated paper and he uses proof through lemmas or something where um, he uses a non-logical axiom of greater than alone proving that there can only be one thing that that meets the definite description so it has to be if there's two then x has to be z mm. so then we go to line 11 we have if x is ontologically imperfectible and z is ontologically imperfectible then x equals z two through 10 conditional proof, then necessarily, because we have total modal scope on all the elements, we have, we can introduce necessary. So necessarily for all X and for all Z, if I X and I Z, this implies that X equals Z. So this gives us, this is a theorem in modal logic. So there's some logic and epistemic warrant for accepting the fact that if a mind goes is if a mind is grounding reality, it has to be only one mind. 
I mean, Aquinas has tons of arguments about why there can only be one mind, but I, I just added this one because it's quite powerful because we can formalize a definition of what it means to be omnipotent, contrary to what the Thomas say. <laughs> and we can prove that it's a theorem and we can formalize that if there's two omnipotent things, they both have to be the same thing. So it would basically be a uh, Frisian sense reference. It would be like the same referent, but at just a different sense. So if, let's say we're talking about Allah and we're talking about the God of Abraham or we're talking about the God of Isaac or whatever. It's just the same first thing that we're referencing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I went through a little bit of basic modal logic there, but if anybody wants to check it on, it's it's on Mo, um, Robert Madoff's modal model of God. So to get into a little bit of the uh, of the Mayangian flair, we've got this excellent argument that uh, Daniel Vecchio he just posted it on online, and he uses um, an epistemic operator called uh, the copyright symbol, which is it is conceivable that. And it's a brilliant way to do it because if we're doing a binary relation such that y is greater than x, if we, if we use c as a predicate, then we can't really modify that binary relation. But if we use it as an operator, we can. So we can say God is the unique thing under uh, Russell's theory of descriptions that it's not copyright or it's not conceivable that there exists a y such that y is greater than x but we don't understand this in a subjective sense we understand this in the Thomistic essence equals existence or a Mayanian Osterstein Osterstein is you can talk about things with so sign or character or we can talk about things with sign being so that's how the sort of the Mayanian and the Thomism work together with Osterstein and the real distinction and I think Daniel Vecchio really, really um, captured that well here using the copyright operator. He also uses an ontological operator in some of his arguments, and that works well with Mayanianism too. He uses actual, it's the at, at with the squiggle, so he uses at. So if something's actual, he differentiates between fictional and actual. I guess under Mayanianism, you can use fictional also as an operator, but I, I haven't done that. I've used Backward Z is exclusive as an operator. So this is sort of like a new logic system that nobody really uses. Hmm. That's, it's sort of, I guess, groundbreaking in that way. So you can say something exists exclusively in a mind or under modes. But anyways, he has for all X, if X is not fictional, then X is real. That's the first premise. Then he has for all X, if X is fictional, then, it's conceivable that there exists a Y such that Y is greater than X because for fictional objects under my, the reason I, the fictional object under my ontology has a lesser degree or a lesser a modal packet with less powers or less potencies. So like a fictional object can think. We can think about Sherlock Holmes as being able to think. He has mm. the potency to think in a logical sense but not in an actual sense. God, you know, Sherlock Holmes can't think about me, but he can think about Watson or something like that. But he can, he can think about other fictional things. I guess this we're getting into a little gray area here, but uh, you sort of get the picture. We can think about fictional objects, but they can think about us. So it's sort of an asymmetric relation there. So he captures that well here. So then he goes through the assumption through universal instantiation. He says, he assumes God is fictional which is what some atheists are telling us. They say, well, the modal ground of everything is a unicorn or the spaghetti monster, but it can't be, right? Because it wouldn't work with the formalization we have here. Because if you plug the spaghetti monster in here, like you have your perfect island, if you plug that into Madol, then you don't have complete um, modal um, scope of the modal operator. You just have, you say, you're saying, something is perfect and it's an island so you right away you you're entering a contradiction in your definite description so it won't work because you say something is perfect and it's an island but it can't be perfect and an island because it's in composition already if you're understanding it properly do you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm, yeah 
So basically what Daniel Vecchio is doing here, he's saying God is a fiction. So if God's a fiction, then there's something that has a better, a bigger modal packet under universal instantiation. So then it's conceivable that something is greater. Then he plugs it into the theory, Russell's theory of descriptions. So exists an X, not conceivable that exists a Y such that Y is greater than X. And for all Z, it's not conceivable there exists a Y such that Y is greater than Z until Z equals X and it's conceivable. So right away, we see that there's a, there's a contradiction in our uh, theory of descriptions. So there can't be one thing that exists under contradiction under Meinungianism. So if you apply a couple more rules, existential instantiation and then um, what is it, commutation and association, then you do simplification, then you get your, you, you get your uh, contradiction. So you have to dispense right away. That's the rule of logic. You have to dispense your assumption that God is a fiction. So then we just have 310 discharge assumption. God is not a fiction. If God is not a fiction under universal instantiation, then God is a real. If God is a real, you know, God exists from modus ponens. So it's a pretty brilliant Meinonian simple argument, but if you, you have to understand the ontology behind it. So when we understand that God exists under a certain mode as a, as a modeless state of being, then the Kant's objection of existence is not a predicate sort of falls away because he's not ex understanding existence in the correct way. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm. Can you, can you unpack that one more time? So just how does, um, Kant's objection that existence is not a predicate falls apart? Well, it falls apart because we're saying, um, like Moore said, if something is actual and something is fictional, mm. then we're predicating existence. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. We're saying it exists in the actual world, but not in the fictional world, or it exists in both. So an actual being, can exist in the actual world and the fictional world as thinking about the fictional world, but the fictional being cannot exist in the actual world because the fictional being cannot think the actual world. You know what I mean? Yeah. So he can't even exist eminently in there. So mm. basically what we're saying is God doesn't exist in any world, really. If you understand God correctly, God is the modal ground. God's creative act is the modal ground of all worlds. God is modeless. So that's where this argument works. We can do a modal ontological argument based on this, which goes over Plantinga's argument, because Plantinga's argument fails due to the defeater that maybe God can't exist in one world, right? So he has God as constrained by worlds. He's existing in a world which is not the proper understanding of God. That's why his modal ontological argument fails mm. right from the get-go. Because if he's saying God exists in one world, then he's sort of saying, he's going from an ex epistemic notion. He's saying, well, God can exist in all the worlds, then God must exist in the actual world. But that doesn't really fly because the real, under his ontology, the, 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 the possible worlds don't exist, but in, only in our minds, right? So he's moving from equivocating on existence. But this argument is not equivocating on existence. It's saying there has to be one ground and if there, if God is not fictional, he has to be that ground. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, so yeah. God is not in the world. God is the foundation of all worlds. So no world can exist without God. That's how it's, we have more powerful modal ontological arguments under this ontology. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes, makes total sense to me. Yeah. I think the hang up that people have on this one is that like how can properties exist mm. or, yeah. or something like, you know, how can we have a, a, a round square? So what I'm saying is um, under my Nyonganism, I had a couple more arguments, but I don't want to bore you guys on it. I'll just go to under my Nyonganism, how things, the modal landscape is working. Like how we can say that properties such as round or square exist. So how we have to understand it is like from a Tegmarkian mathematical universe hypothesis he has his ensemble where if we use math 
and topology, we can say that um, the equation for square is this, or volume is this. So volume implies the property of, of having shape. So we're saying in that sense, shape exists as an equation. So with our minds, what we're doing is when we're rendering, we're taking the equation for shape. We don't see shape really in reality. We're seeing sort of underlying it. It's like a digital physics way of seeing reality, but it comes out as if we are seeing shape in our mind, but we're seeing, so the equation exists, the shape, the equation for shape, the equation for square. We can put those two together, but they don't work because as a nuclear property, we can only talk about it as a so sign, but not a sign being. It can't have existence because it's got contradictory properties, right? So that's the way my sort of motivation for giving the Mainyangian element. So something like a natural number can exist because its quiddity is such that it can be rendered in digital physics as an equation. So you see how sort of holographic universe is working with Thomism and essences and quiddities? Yeah. Does that sort of fly in your mind? Uh, as of now, yes. You know, like, um, I mean, it seems to make sense. And, and even, even too, if there are any Thomists with hesitations, I think, you know, the fact that we believe that God is the, right, is the foundation of reality, the supreme reality, and he's intellect, and he's simple. I mean, this idea that, like, right. mind is the fundamental source should not be as troubling as it is. You know, and I think, I think even too, like, um, we, we've been kind of poisoned by materialism and microphysicalism yeah. because people, right. people cannot think beyond those paradigms. So when you talk about yeah. properties existing or neo or minonianism, they just don't know what to do with it, you know? So they, they right. literally are put in a box, yeah. you know, and they can't think outside the box. Sometimes, yes. Right. That's why, like, when somebody will say, I'll hear a philosopher say, well, that's, that would be a non-existent object. Like, right away, how can you be a philosopher and say that that's a non-existent object when you've thought about it? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. in some respect, it is an object. There can't be, right away, you're causing a contradiction. That's where my young is succeeding. In a way, that object has an existence. It's, it's thinly layered. So let's say we're saying under existential Mainyangian Thomism, we have um, matter as phenomenal S, S commune phenomenal S, rational S, because it can be thought of in a mind, there's intentional S behind it, but it doesn't have like an actus ascendi maybe, where it can be we can see numbers walking around like natural numbers, right? They, they don't have an actus ascendi like a, like a human would. So they can't be rendered in that way because that's not part of their, their packet, their modal packet. They don't have that uh, formal potency to, to walk. You know what I mean? So that's yeah. how we can understand it as things existing under different modes of S, but with quiddities that can contract that S. So they do exist, and it is a sort of Platonism because God is sustaining it as S subsistence, right? But maybe it, it's, it's difficult for people to understand. You have to read a little bit on existential Thomism, and it's mm. like I'm syncretizing the two, which is what Aquinas did in his day. You know, he would be syncretizing two different schools of thought and try to make it into one thing a coherent thought so i think i have some warrant here logical warrant to to go with what i'm talking about even though it might not be perfect idealism it's sort of like a reductive idealism so i just had this one extra page i didn't i, I forgot it I'll, I'll read it out now it's like if we look at the modal landscape we need to understand god is that which cannot admit of more active potency since a physical system in principle always admits of myriad passive potencies because a physical system has all these passive potencies. So it's always acted upon and acting on other things. The omnipotent ground must be a metaphysical mind or a non-physical mind or Cantor's absolute infinity. 
in its creative act of self-apprehension. So hence the omnipotent ground cannot be a math object or a fiction, since such objects have limited or constrained modal packets under the Mayanian ontology. So a modal packet is a way to describe the powers of equity or an essence with its contracted modes of S and it becomes a quantum of being. So we can understand essences and essence exists in a, maybe in, as Avicenna would say, or as John Dunn Scott is, we have merely possibles, we have actuals, we have impossibles. Impossibles are dependent on minds to deem that they're impossible. So uh, under this Thomistic Mayanian existentialism, a quantum of being is something that is essence with all of its modes of existence that is existing in logical space. And it's, it's doing causation through act potency privation and it's sustained by God. So that's how we sort of have to see causation as just act potency, act potency, things working out their own modal packet in the modal structure of reality. So a natural number has an essence type, it's countable information, it has sign, yet it can exist as a token under different modes of composition. So it has potent accidents, a sculpture of a natural number, or it can exist in the mind of a fiction, or you know, let's say in a comic book, there's something that's thinking the number five and it has that type of existence. So it has different sign than the type in some instantiations. So if we look at essence quiddity as a modal packet, then we see tantum s does not exist in a world, so to speak, or as an every world object. So God is not an every world object or a participant because then God would be constrained. But as the omnipotent ontologically imperfectible ground, since reality has a modal structure, so we do not have monistic or mechanistic causation. I've said this many times before, but only in a quantum sense where we have different potencies that can be sort of decohere into a, into an intelligible timeline. So it's like things acting out their potencies in a modal theater where souls are the most concrete among abstract objects and God is the pure concrete object that's sustaining everything through the shadows of himself knowing. So that's sort of like the whole ontology in a nutshell. John, I'm blown away. Um, is that everything that you wanted to share? Is there anything else? You know what, I, 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 it's, been, it's been quite a bit. Like I can come on another day or you can just forget. <laughs> I know, I, yeah, I think that's good because my voice is getting a little bit harsh because I'm a little bit older. Mm. Is it? Do you think I got the point across? Yeah, you got the point across. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think people have to understand it as not a. It's a different sort of idealism. It's it's a reduction to God's act of understanding. And if in the interim we under we we discover more about reality, maybe we can update it a bit, right? Mm. So I hope people don't sort of just jettison the idea and say, well, that's just uh, a sophistry or madness. Mm. <laughs> that it has a real, there, there are some logical grounds in there. I mean, I have lots of other logical arguments that I can go through, but we'd be here for the rest of the afternoon, right? <laughs> or the rest of the night for me. Oh yeah, the rest of the night for you, yeah. And I'm mm. sorry about the, the tower here, it must be, it must be overused tower. Like I said, we're here in Borneo and sometimes the, the reception is not good. Mm. So yeah. just one last question. Um, yeah. Would you, so I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I have so many things on my reading list. I have so many projects that I'm doing right now, but um, would you like a book that, what book would you recommend for understanding or what books would you recommend for understanding a lot of what you've given and for people to chew on? So for instance, um, okay, a, a good book I have, a really good book in understanding existential Thomism and what mean, we mean of quanta of being and things like that is the ultimate reducibility of essence to existence in existential metaphysics by William E. Carlo. Mm. 
Have you heard of that book? No, I've not. That's one heck of a title too. Yeah, it's quite a profound book. It's very good, but it has a lot of, uh, it might have a lot of Latin footnotes in it, which is sad, but you'd get the gist of existential Thomism from that. And let me see, another good book. Hmm. I would, uh, I would urge people to read, you know, you could look up on the internet. You wouldn't want to maybe read a book by, uh, by Meinjong, it might be in German, right? You'd have to get it in, a, in an English translation, but you'd probably just want to look up the Stanford, uh, the Meinjong's Jungle. You can, you can Google that, Meinjong's Jungle, and you can work on that. And then you can see how the, the, the idea of Ostersein sort of works with the idea of the Thomist um, real distinction between essence and existence. So you'd want to look up that. The existential Thomism, and hmm, I can't really think off the top of my head because there's just so many books. Mm. You'd want to look up something that has to do with the holographic universe. So if you can read anything about that, like the ADS-CFT correspondence, so look up papers about that, about holographic universe, black hole information paradox, uh, quantum many worlds. The Everett, the, the Everett uh, notion of the quantum many worlds as the universal wave function being something real, so we can understand it as prime matter. Um, I, I think that would be about it. Like, other than reading, like, well, I've read so much on Thomas Aquinas that it's crazy, right? So, mm. I don't know. You'd have to really read quite a bit on Thomas Aquinas. John Dunn Scott is sort of is in there a little bit. Avicenna is good because he talks about possibles. Anything Avicenna, John Dunn Scott is, he's, uh, talks about God as a first principle. That would be a good book to read because he talks about final causality in that one. So, yeah, I would definitely check out John Dunn Scott's on God as a first principle. Have you heard of that book, the treatise? It's like a big long argument that's tons and tons and tons of articles. It's a few, I don't know, maybe 50 pages, something. It's just a huge argument and it gives a rationale behind how God is a final cause, how you can't have a accidental order without an efficient order of causality. So Don, John Dunn Scottis is another good one to look into, yeah. Because he's yeah. got that notion of merely possible essence that can be actualized. That's another argument I was going to go through, but I don't think that we have enough time for that. Because another rationale to understand God is that he can't be actualized. So God is either impossible or God is merely possible or God is complete. He can't be merely possible because from his definite description, as Robert Madoff, he has to be ontologically imperfectible. So if God is possible, God exists. He can make that jump. And I think that's a pretty elegant uh, argument. If uh, There's a couple of uh, discussions of it on the internet. You can check it out. It's like uh, John Dunn Scott's modal argument discussion. Hmm. Yeah, also, so um, you, to read. you know, I, I ordered uh, Nigel Cundy's book, What is Physics? So I'm hoping that will that's be... Good, right? Learn physics from him. Yeah, he's pretty smart. He went to Oxford University. So like, I heard he wrote a 700 page book. Yeah, yep. I ordered it. So I'm really uh, well, excited to read it. And then there's um, to uh, Thomistic Existentialism and Cosmological Reasoning. What, what are your thoughts on that book by Canassus? If I'm saying his name right. Oh, that one I haven't started. I haven't read that one. Mm. No. I, I've just read this existential Thomas, a few other existential Thomism, but I don't know that book, so I couldn't give you a good, I couldn't give you a good critique on it. Well, John, thank you for um, just the time that you spent today talking to me. Thank you for, yeah. I mean, opening up something new for me in Thomism, you know, and now I have That's like good. new things to explore. And um, before I, I end the episode, yeah, is there also, anything you want to say? No, I, I want to say thank you for letting me speak. Like this is, I'm normally an introverted person and I'm sorry that the picture didn't work. 
I guess it's just our uh, the the gulf between you and me. So the uh, of, of land mass, right? So mm-hmm. maybe it's just the internet just failed us today. But at least you could hear me. Yeah. You saw me a little bit at the beginning. Maybe you can include that so that people can just sort of see what I look like. <laughs> but that's not really important. I'm glad I got the the message out there. I I could really explain it better, but it would maybe be fodder for a book we can write a book about that later on we'll see how it works out yeah if you write a book i'll i'll be sure to buy it (laughs) oh that would be great okay i appreciate all your time all right thank you john okay take care